1100s, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He rose up through the ranks of clergy. He was a monk. You often see him in his white habit. Looks like this, but with a hood. And he was very, very bright and very diplomatic. He was involved with so much intrigue during that time in the church's existence. For instance, at one point there were two popes, and he backed the correct one. He was influential with his writing, his, his intelligence, his preaching. And those days, well, I guess maybe people do it today too, priests do it today too. They write out their sermons. I, I don't write out my sermons. I depend on the Holy Spirit. This way, if I make a mistake, you can blame the Holy Spirit. And so we have hundreds of sermons from St. Bernard of Clairvaux. The area in which he founded monasteries, mostly in France and Italy, beautiful, beautiful, severely executed monasteries. And from them, we have such beautiful Gregorian chant because the monks used to sit in what we call choirs, which are benches facing each other with the altar in the center. And they would sing the Gregorian chant. They would sing the Psalms, the beautiful Psalms, like we said today. And they had a very strict diet, simple food, meat, maybe a holiday, but mostly simple meals. And during their meals, the scriptures were read. And these were all in honor of the original mon monks, the Benedictines, founded by St. Benedict. But this was many years later, in the 1100s, St. Bernard. Now, one of the things we always associate Bernard with is Mary. He had a great devotion to Our Lady and delivered many sermons honoring her. And today I took a page from the parish calendar. It's last month's calendar, it's, so I just ripped out. Nobody's going to miss it. <laughs> but there's a picture of it. If you have this at home, check it out. There's a picture of St. Bernard speaking to Mary. It's a, it's a painting. It's not a historical event. It's a painting that depicts his devotion to Mary. And we say his prayer every time we pray the rosary. It's called a memorare. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly to you, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To you do I come, before you I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petition, but in your mercy hear and answer me. Amen. St. Bernard. Beautiful words that we often repeat when we're saying the rosary. And basically, it shows his devotion to Mary, but the universal church's devotion to Mary dependent upon her as our mother, as our intercessor. She's not God. She's, she's Boar, Jesus, Theotokos, we call her. She's the bearer of God who carried Jesus into the world, but she's Jesus' mother. And if Jesus had a relationship with his mother, like I had with my mother, you're set. Whatever you wanted from my mother or from me, you go to my mother. And she did this many, many years. I mean, she, she loved both of her kids, Michael, my brother, and me. And she was very protective of her. And it's, it's very interesting for us to project onto Mary the possible relationship she had with Jesus 
and parallel it to our relationship to our own mothers. I know some of us have had bad women as our mothers. We know there's, there's disasters in every family possibly, and we know there's addiction and alcoholism in many families, including abuse. So for those mothers, we pray today, especially. And for the children of those mothers, we pray today. Because the scars of their parents are in them and on them. And as a family therapist, I know that to be true through experiences. However, I remember a time, but this, this was common. When I was in the seminary, and it's an Italian parish, Holy Rosary in Jersey City. Everybody knew everybody. So everybody knew Louis in the seminary. And when I would come home, people would call my mother. Say, oh, Rose, can you have Louis talk to, I'll say, you know, anybody, Joey or Jerry or Mary. You know, they're going through a hard time. This, this is their, their kids, friends of my mother's children. Yeah, no problem, she would say not consulting me at all. So I'd come home to eat, of course. That was the number one thing I used to come home for. And she said, okay, after you eat, uh, you're going to go over to Josie's house and speak to Bobby. Uh, about what? I don't know, but go. <laughs> and I always felt that dilemma of Jesus at Cana when she came, Mary came over to Jesus and said, uh, they have no more wine, and Jesus, my time is not, come, not here yet. Well, what am I supposed to do about it? She ignored him. She said to the servants, do what he tells you. And I swear, my mother must have ingrained that section of the scriptures in her heart because she always ignored me when I would say, what, why? What, what, what am I going to do for them? What am I going to it's, it's a teenager. They're going to just go, she'd say. And I would. Now, she was also, you know, I'm spending a lot of time on my mother, but why not? We're dedicated to Mary, and St. Bernard was dedicated to Mary, and I think he, his dedication teaches us to venerate Mary and our own mothers. And we all have lots of stories about our mothers, okay? They, they're the most influential, good news, bad news, for those who are dysfunctional, but good news for most of us that the influences of our mothers and fathers, our parents, but we're focusing on mothers, was important and, and formational, made us who we are in so many ways. The only thing she never taught me was how to cook. She taught me how to eat, but never taught me how to cook. Okay, so she would often be involved with everything the parish had to do. You know, like, where, where does our inspiration come from? I was raised going to card parties with my mother to carry things, to bring, never stayed for the, the, the society's card parties, but I would carry things. I would make decorations because I was artistic, so I would make banners and posters that Rose would bring to Holy Rosary and put them around in the auditorium for whatever event. We were there every day, I mean, doing something. I went to Catholic school, so all, all the eighth, up until eighth grade, it was literally there every day. But even after I graduated high school, Rose was very influential. She was chair of everything you had. She was president of the St. Anthony's Society. She was chair of the, the Rosary Altar Society, the Linen Society, and the list goes on and on and on. And she wasn't a stick in the mud. She wasn't like a holy roller. I mean, I loved her dearly, but she wasn't a holy roller. She was a woman, a really woman, a real strong woman, a Jersey City woman, and she had a mouth like a truck driver. I'm not saying Mary is like her or she was like Mary, but she would tell you where to, where to go if you got in her way. But the church, number one. The priests, gold. The nuns, wonderful unless you touched her son. There's a story in the family that goes on every year, maybe an anniversary or when we're talking about the religious life of the parish. I was seventh grade 
I'm going on about Mary, but I, I, I'm going on about my mother because of the role of Mary in our lives. Mary should be influential. Mary influ should have influenced your mothers and my mothers, and we should appreciate that influence. And if we think Mary was not an influence in our mother's lives, ignore it. Go to Mary. Go to Mary. Ad Jesum per Mariam, which is what John Paul II would always say, to Jesus through Mary. So Mary was always available. I, my mother didn't, didn't know that theologically. She took control. So I was, quote, her Jesus, and she would take control. One day, seventh grade, classic story in my family. I had the Filipini sisters, not Filipino, Filipini sisters, founded by St. Lucy Filipini, an Italian order, and I love them. I still love them, and we have a lot of contact with them. I was in the seventh grade, and I was a patrol boy. I would wear this little badge and all that and see kids across the street. And one day, one of the kids in the third grade had a little toy. He pulled a string, and it flew. And I said to him, you know, all my seventh grade authority, I said, you can't have that online. I have to take that from you. So, I mean, I was terrible in that way. So I took it so I could play with it. Believe me, I wasn't being like a guardian angel. So I took the thing, and I'm playing with it, and the kids are all gone, and the patrol moderator was Sister Pasqualina. She was looking out the window of the school and saw me on duty playing with this little whirly gig. She was not happy. She brought me upstairs and says, you, you took that from that boy and you played with it. With a face as straight as can be, I said, no, I didn't. No, I was lying. I knew I was lying. Nobody doubted I was lying. And she saw it. Now, coincidentally, background is my mother would always meet me at 3.15 after school at one particular door because my grandmother lived right across the street, close-knit neighborhood. And we'd go there for espresso at 3 o'clock and, and biscotti. So my mother was waiting for me. I, I didn't come out. So she went up the stairs in this classroom, and it had two doors, the front door and the back door, and she heard Pasqualina yelling at me. <laughs> you, you didn't yell at her kids, okay? And I'm, I'm upstairs, and Pasqualina is saying, you better admit what you did, or else I'm going to smack you right across the face. And just as she said that, my mother appeared at the back door and saw Pasqualina smack me across the face. She was Sicilian, my mother. She went berserk, berserk. Let me tell you, berserk. She ran up the classroom and she says, I'm going to rip your veil off and poetically beat you up, basically, she said. I can't repeat it in church. Pasqualina knew she was serious. She ran out the classroom door. My mother ran after her. She ran down the stairs. Pasqualina ran down the stairs. My mother ran down the stairs after her. And I ran after my mother. I felt like an episode of the Keystone Cops. And she ran around the school and went into the convent. She had the key. She ran into the convent. My mother's pounding on the convent door. And I'm, I'm like a seventh grade. I was hysterical. Ma, stop. No, no, no. So Sister Grace came out. Sister Grace was the mother superior, very good friend of my mother's, a very good friend of all of us. Wonderful woman. And Grace says, Rose, w what's going on? She says, bring Pasqualina out here. She touched my son. I'm going to rip the veil off her head and beat the blank out of her. <laughs> so Sister Grace says, why are you going to rip the veil off her head to do that? She says, you got to respect the veil. So she had that very simple devotion to the church and the nuns. So it didn't happen. My mother 
calm down, grace calm down, and eventually we all met in peace and we reconciled and Pasqualina became one of our very good friends. She was gonna beat the blank out of that nun because she touched her son. Now, going to Calvary, just think of what Mary felt and experienced as she saw them spit on her son and carry the cross and whip him. This is the mother of the church. It's no accident that we have Mary as a pivotal figure in the church. She is the person to go through to Jesus. If you choose not to, that's your business. But she is the patron of the church. She's patron of families. And she can really teach us the relationship that we have with people because she was totally human. Jesus was human and God, but Mary was totally human. She wasn't a goddess. She's a saint, she's holy, but she's totally human. So all her emotions are your emotions and my emotions. And that's very important for us to identify with her because she's the mother of God. You want something from God, you go to the mother. Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mother of Jesus Christ. Thank you.